I'd like to ask you tonight, if you would, to please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Psalms, Psalms 100. A report was done on what was the most popular book in all the Bible that Christians turn to to read. And the answer is the book of Psalms. So why is it? What is it about the book of Psalms that makes it so attractive to Christians? Why would you turn to that book over maybe another book like Obadiah or Habakkuk or perhaps Galatians or the Revelation? And I think most of you already know the answer, but there is something about it that gives you an emotional connection to God. And this series, this year, I've been preaching a series entitled Encountering God, a study through the Psalms. And the idea of the book of Psalms is it is, gives you a direct link up, if I could say it that way, to God. It's, it's like a spiritual IV that gives you direct message from God into the bloodline of your soul. The fourth century early church father Augustine said that the book of Psalms reorients your life to God, both spiritually and morally. That is, the book itself orients you to correctly think about and understand and how to approach God. So there are 150 psalms, and there are many variety of psalms. For example, there are psalms of praise, and there are psalms of thanksgiving. There are psalms of confession. One-third of the psalms are called psalms of lament. Have you ever heard of a lament? What does a lament mean? It means life stinks, but God is still good. It means that you go through life, it's hard, it's difficult, But in the end, you discover God is still good. So the book of Psalms is really, really important for us. So if if you learn anything tonight, I'd like you to go home thinking, I need to read the book of Psalms. So what I would like to do tonight is to begin with the first Psalm. And here's why I'd like to start with the first Psalm. Because the first Psalm is considered the introduction to all the rest. The great Baptist preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Have you ever heard of Charles Spurgeon? Have you ever heard of him? Have you ever wondered why everybody quotes Spurgeon? Well, if you ever read Spurgeon, you would know why. Because he's the most quotable person in the world when it comes to preaching. And Charles Spurgeon viewed Psalm 1 as the text for like, you know how a pastor stands up and he, and he reads a Bible text and then he preaches from it? He viewed Psalm 1 as the text for the rest of the Psalms. In other words, it's the introduction. It's the doorstep to the rest of the Psalms. If you understand Psalm 1, then you'll get the direction for the rest of the book. So tonight, I'd like us to look at this Psalm, and I'd like us to spend some time seeking to understand it. And I hope the Lord will give us grace and challenge our hearts tonight as we read Psalm 1, and we'll read all six verses. I'll read out loud as you follow along with me. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth bringeth forth its fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Ask God to bless our time in his word tonight. Father, we are thankful truly for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us in inspiration. We have your words. You have kept your word for us today through preservation so that we have tonight 
the words of God. And we thank you for that. Now, Lord, bless tonight. Strengthen your people. Strengthen them on their way. Help them to learn to live for you daily and to live for you faithfully. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 1 is the first of 150 psalms. The psalms, by the way, were the Jewish songbook. It's what the Jewish people sing. So this was a psalm intended to be sung. It's called a wisdom psalm because it's, it's giving you advice on how to live a wise life. And as we begin the psalm tonight and as we look at it, what's very interesting to me is that we are surprised to discover that in the very beginning of this psalm, the writer named King David, who wrote a good portion of the psalms, addresses the deepest desire of the human heart. The psalms cuts right into your heart and it exposes that what you actually want in life. And what is that? What is it that everybody wants in life? What is it? Say it, brother. Happiness. Happiness. What is the first word in the book of Psalms? What's the first word? Say it with me. Say it. Blessed. What does the word blessed mean? What does it mean to be blessed? It means to be happy. The first thing the Bible addresses in the book of Psalms is the fact that through the Lord, you and I can be happy. Blessed is the man. Question tonight, how important is it to be happy? Amen. I like that. The Greek philosopher Aristotle believed that happiness was the ultimate end of the purpose of our human existence. He advocated a strong liberal arts education because he believed that if you educated the whole person, it would produce a happy and productive society and people. How important is it to be happy? It was so important to the founding fathers of the United States of America that they wrote that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was our constitutional right. How important is it to be happy? It is very important to the book publishing industry. In the year 2000, 50 books were published on happiness. In the year 2008, 4,000 books in that year were published on the subject of happiness. Currently, Amazon holds 66,000 books on the subject of happiness, yet according to one poll, only one in three Americans consider themselves very happy people. Happy, blessed is the man. Maybe you're here tonight and you ask, does God really want me to be happy? Not only does God want you to be happy, but God wants you to be perpetually happy. Because the word blessed in the original Hebrew language is in the plural. It means perpetually blessed. You could read it this way, blessednesses or happinesses. So the question then tonight is this, how can I be happy, happy, happy? And Psalm 1 tells us, and David starts out by saying this, that happiness is based on your choices. Or let me put it this way. I would say it to my four children. If you ain't happy, it ain't my fault. You understand that? If you're not happy, you have nobody else to blame but you. So I came all the way up from South Carolina to tell you that. If you ain't happy, it's your own fault. And what the writer here is telling us is that happiness is based on your choices. And since it's a wisdom song, that happiness is directly related to God. 
because your choices have to be in alignment with God's way of happiness. And so what does David do here? He sets forth two ways of life. God keeps it simple. You ever notice that? It's not complicated. God operates by the KISS principle. You ever heard of the KISS principle? Keep it simple what? Not stupid. God never causes people stupid. Keep it simple, saints. All right? Keep it simple. He lays out two ways. And what are those ways? One way leads to misery and the other way leads to prosperity in the, in the truest sense. One is the way of happiness and the other is the way of sorrow. So tonight we're going to look at these two ways. I'm going to spend the bulk of my time on the first way, the way to happiness, the right way, and then we'll take a few minutes to close out on the, on the way to misery as he sets out. So let's look at it. Notice what he says in verse 1. He says, blessed is the man that, and then he lays out the way that he lives. Psalm 1 captures a fundamental teaching that is found both in the Old and New Testament, and that is your choices determine the direction and the outcome of your life. De Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. We come to the New Testament. Jesus said, enter at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that findeth. In the Bible, we have two decisions that leave, lead you in two directions that lead you to two ultimate destinies. And there should be no surprise that David is showing us that right way. God's way is clear and you need to walk in it. And so just like a battery has two poles, a negative and a positive, the way to happiness has also two poles, a negative and a positive. Something to be avoided and something to be followed. And what is the negative way that we're to avoid? Notice what he says. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. David starts out with a warning that there are serious threats to your spiritual health and happiness. Have you ever come into church when everybody's got a cold? Do you shake hands or do you fist bump? Or do you elbow bump? Okay. When you're, so, when you're sick, I don't want you to share your blessings. Okay. I, I don't want to, you know, God bless you. You stay over there. I stay over here. So we understand that in life, there are things that we avoid. And what the writer here is doing is he is teaching us that there is danger in the realm of interpersonal relationships. You could say it this way. There are relationships that we are to avoid. Happiness cannot be separated from relationships. And according to what David is saying here is that there are people that we are to avoid because if you get close to them, they will spread their sickness to you. Blessed is the man that walks not. Blessed is the man that stands not. Blessed is the man that sits not. So who are these who threaten our spiritual life fundamentally these are those who are pursuing happiness without God. Fundamentally, they do not buy into the fact that the way to be happy is through God. I've been the president of Bob Jones for four years. And I work in a college all week. And on Sundays, I go to church. People ask me, does it bother you to go to church, you know, to different churches every weekend and then go back to work on Monday? And my answer is absolutely not. 
Let me tell you something. I get to go to church. I have to go to work on Monday. You understand what I'm saying? Pressure is not Sunday morning. Pressure is Monday morning. I love coming to church. Why? Because this is the people of God. I don't go to bars on Saturday night. I go to church on Sunday morning. To me, happy hour is Sunday morning. You understand what I'm talking about? So I have discovered that happiness and joy and peace is found in the presence of the people of God. What he is saying is this. There are those people that you are to avoid. Life, these are those who believe that life is about satisfying and fulfilling their own self-centered dreams. With regard to God, his ways are ignored, scorned, or held into, in contempt. To them, the moral law of God is to be treated as irrelevant, archaic, and unintelligent. David called these people ungodly, sinners, scornful. He says their influence is insidious. It is powerful. It starts out with a simple walk. You hang out together. Soon their influence starts to rub off on you and you find yourself beginning to agree with their values and their direction. It then leads to standing with them. You now begin to associate, identify with them. You are becoming like them. Finally, you become one of them by joining them and sitting with them. Friendships can be a dangerously slippery slope that can spiral downward towards destruction. And the irony of those who pursue happiness without God is that they never find it. It's an elusive dream like a mirage in the desert. So the psalmist is saying that the way to happiness is by decisively avoiding negative, toxic influences of the world. I read the story about a man who dialed a wrong number one day, and he got the following recording. The recording said, I'm not available right now, but I thank you for caring enough to call. I am making some changes in my life. Please leave a message after the beep. If I do not return your call, you will know that you are one of the changes. <laughs> one of the happiest and most important decisions I ever made in my life after I became a Christian was to change the influences of my life. You know, for the child of God, let me tell you something, my friend, for the child of God... The place of your social life ought to be the local church. You know where I met my wife? In church, brother. In church. You know where we got married? In church. You know where, I, where, I, where all my best friends are? In church. Fact is, I was an evangelist. You know where, you know where our house was? in the church parking lot. <laughs> All my friends are godly people and they influence you. So for you as a church member, you work in the world, but you need to make your best friends and your best associations those who are pursuing happiness by knowing the Lord. So the first thing he deals with is the negative side. Then we go to the positive side. And notice what he says. In verse 2, happiness is based upon nurturing a deepening relationship with God's word. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. A happy man has discovered that the Bible is a continual and a perpetual source of pleasure. What do you delight in? No, 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 no. I, I mean, what do you like, you really like? What is a delight to you? 
I don't have too many things in my life that I delight in. I have a lot of things I have to do. You understand what I'm saying? But delight, I delight in good coffee. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. Okay? I'm a coffee snob. I like good coffee, expensive preferably. Okay? I like, I grew up playing sports, so I like sports. I have one sport I like in particular. I played it in, in college. I coached it. I love soccer. So I'm, I'm a soccer fan. And of course, if you're a real soccer fan, that means you like European soccer. Okay? So I have a favorite team. My favorite team is in England. It's not Chelsea. That's a girl's name. It's Manchester United. Anybody here a Manchester United fan? Anybody here dislike Manchester United? How many of you really don't even know what they are? Okay, that's the rest of you. All right, so. So the wonderful thing, a wonderful thing today in the United States of America is that every Saturday I can watch Manchester United play. And thankfully, they play 38 weeks out of 52. So every Saturday, if I'm not available to watch it, I have this wonderful blessing. It's called DVR. And I will DVR the game and I'll go home and watch it later on. And I sit there and I delight in it. I also delight in music. I love music. I play a musical instrument. It's called a mandolin. And I traveled on a team and, and basically we practiced two hours a day. It was my favorite time of the day. Everybody else thought it was work. I thought it was play. And so I play the mandolin and I can play sacred music. I can, I can play Irish music. I can even go up to a higher heavenly style called bluegrass, and I can play bluegrass music. And you know, I'm at Bob Jones University. Bob Jones University is not known as a bluegrass school. It's very, very classical and proper. You understand what I'm saying? But I found two sisters at Bob Jones University who grew up in a bluegrass family band. And I met them. Their names are Mariah and Madison. I said, I hear you can play bluegrass. And they looked at me and said, yeah. So I, I wanted to see what they really knew, you know. And you know how to ask the right questions? So I asked Mariah, I said, well, what kind of guitar you got? You know, if she said Yamaha, I went, yeah, you don't know bluegrass. She said a D28. He's exactly right. It's a Martin. You say a D28, you don't need to say a Martin because you already know what it is. So I said, okay. And then they came up to my office one day. I said, I want you to bring your instruments. Come up to my office. And they came into my office and I closed the door. And I said, um, I said, what songs do you know? And they started whipping out all these, we call them fiddle tunes. And I know, I know them all. And I said, start playing. They started playing. I I got so excited. I grabbed my mandolin. And I started playing. The happiest day of the week for me is at five o'clock on one, one of those days that the sisters come to my office. And for an hour and a half, I go on bluegrass vacation. And you know what? I get my fix for the week. And I'm so happy. And do you understand what I mean by delighting? Now, the Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, out of all the things I've told you I enjoy, everything I've told you I enjoy pales into insignificance to the one thing that I do every single day. And that is every single morning I wake up, the hardest thing of the day is waking up and getting out of bed. I get up, I go make a pot of coffee. You can, by the way, you can be saved and not drink coffee, but you can't be spiritual. Okay. <laughs> and I go and take a shower and I come back and I make my coffee and I sit down and I've, I've been doing this. I have been doing this now for 42 years. And every morning I spend the first hour of the day in my Bible. 
and I love it. I don't like it. I love it. Because I've learned how to read the Bible, and it's like eating ice cream every morning with chocolate cake and whipped cream on top every day. Because I've learned how to read this book in such a way that I discover God and I delight in God and I enjoy God. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Where is the way to happiness? Folks, it's in this book. I know it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit the way the world thinks. The world doesn't think happiness is found in reading an old archaic book. But God is saying that the way that you know me is not you trying to figure me out or trying to find me on your own. God has revealed himself through his revealed word. And if you read the Bible, if you're a believer and you depend on the Holy Spirit to help you understand the Bible, as you read the Bible, God comes and manifests himself to you. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. As you read the Lord in his presence is fullness of joy. You know, you know it's the biggest problem at Bob Jones University? I can tell you what it is. We got 25, 2800 students and they ain't all reading their Bible. And I got to live with them. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. That if we don't read the Bible, we really don't get it. And so his delight is in the law of, his, of the Lord. So the question then is this, how is it that you learn to delight? What is the pathway to delight? And he tells us here, but his delight is in the law of the Lord... And in his law doth he what? He meditates day and night. What does it mean to meditate? All right. Lots of different illustrations. But let me give you one that makes sense for me. My wife and I, Terry, have been married now 38 years. We have four children. And... Uh, when we, when, we, when we do get to take a vacation that we really want to take, okay, I'm not talking about an in-law vacation, a real vacation we want to take, we'll, we'll do a big vacation about once every five years. And over the years, my wife's favorite place to go is, to, is Hawaii. And uh, man, I mean, it's like, you say, why do people like Hawaii? Apparently you didn't go there. <laughs> you have, all right. You like it? Ah, yeah. oh, it's beautiful, man. So, and, 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 and we're pretty simple. We don't have to have anything fancy. But, you know, there are a couple of things we like to do. And, of course, one of them is just to enjoy the, the countryside. And we like to go snorkeling. So we'll go and rent out for a week a pair of snorkeling, uh, you know, equipment. And then we'll just go find a place to go swim, try to, you know, get away from people and just go find a place. And we found a place when we, we went a couple of years ago. And it's like the last, it's always the last day. You find it the last day. And we found hardly anybody was there. And if you've ever gone snorkeling, you'll understand this. When you look out at the ocean, I mean, after a while, an ocean is an ocean. It's just water. You really don't see a lot. You just see a lot of water. But when you start snor snorkeling, that is you drop below the surface, it's like a whole nother world especially if the water's clear, okay? We're not talking about what you have up here. We're talking about, you understand. And we found this place and we went out snorkeling and I'm telling you, it was crazy. We put on our mask, dropped below the surface of the water, boom, there was a giant sea turtle right there, just like floating along, you know? And when you're under the water, it's not like you can carry on a conversation with your wife. You can't go, wow, that doesn't work. 
So you're underwater, you're just trying to communicate with your eyes going. <laughs> and it was like, you just want to stay under there because you see so many things and you want to gaze at them and be focused on them. What does it mean to meditate? Meditation is not just a skimming through the Bible real fast. It's kind of dropping below the sur surface with spiritual goggles and looking and studying and thinking about. It's thinking about it. It's asking yourself questions. It's pondering over it. And the more you read your Bible, the more you want to read your Bible. That's the way spiritual appetite works. The more you pray, the more you pray. The more you witness, the more you witness. The more you read your Bible, the more you read your Bible. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. It, it becomes what his default mode is. Day and night means all the time. Today we're living in a technological age, cell phones. And what has become the default mode of people today mentally is their cell phone. How do you know? Well, all you got to do is walk into a restaurant or walk into a place of business on the campus of Bob Jones University. It's the same thing. You walk in and what are people doing? Now, I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just simply saying it becomes your deep mental default mode. It's what you go to when you have free time to think. So what David is saying, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his, in his, in his law, he defaults day and night. He keeps going back to the word. In one way, technology is one of the greatest threats to our spiritual life. I mean, it is here to stay. It's not going to go away. But it's a threat. Because people spend less time thinking about the Word of God and meditation on it. And therefore, it affects their happiness. And there's a, la there's a shallowness in their life spiritually. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And what is the result in his life? He finds a sense of fulfillment because he finds himself growing. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. What does this mean? Planted by the rivers of water is not referring to a natural tree growing by a natural stream. That's not the picture. Rather, it is a planted tree. A planted tree means it's being cultivated like an apple orchard or an orange grove or a vineyard of grapes. It's being cultivated by water that is being brought to the tree by means of a channel or what we would call irrigation. The soul here is being cultivated through intentional times in the word. Because a natural tree growing by a natural tree, there's no discipline to it. It's just happening. But when you see a farm, it means that there's a purpose, there's a plan, it's intentional. And the scripture is teaching us that the way that we grow and prosper as a Christian is that we have intentional times in the word. And there is a perpetual flow of an abundant supply of spiritual life that sustains you, strengthens you, and satisfies you. And what is the result? It brings about an effective change in your life. Spiritual fruit. What do you mean by spiritual fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, meekness. Folks, you don't develop that overnight. The only thing that grows overnight are weeds, and you don't eat those for breakfast in the morning. Fruit comes over time. There's a consistency, and it comes out of your life. There's a perpetual flow of God's grace. You're building up well springs in your life, and you continue to bear fruit even when life is difficult. Notice what it says. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What that means is simply this, that 
we as Christians are going to go through hard times, valleys, but we turn those valleys into the wells that we have. Hard times for a believer actually are not bad times. They become productive times. You see, the test of your faith is always going to come during your trials. And people who are in the word turn those times into productive times of spiritual growth. The best times for Christians are often the hardest times. Because that's when you, how many of you, when you have a hard time, pray more? How many of you, when you have a hard time, read your Bible? And when you read your Bible, it speaks to you more. Well, why does it work that way? Because you've been delighting in the law of the Lord. And in the times of hard times and difficulty, you will not wither, but you will become strong. And your life is prosperous. That means enriched, blessed, valuable, useful. You're truly, you know, when we're being used of the Lord and growing, that's when we're our happiest. So that's the way. That's really what the book of Psalms is all about. It's the way of, it's the everlasting way, the way to walk in. So let me be quick in the finishing conclusion. And that is he, he deals with the wrong way. He deals with the way of the ungodly. The ungodly, verse 4, are not so, okay? But they are different. <clears throat> they are like chaff. What is chaff? It's that unusual, unusable part in wheat that once wheat is cut down and you begin to separate it, the wheat separated from the chaff, it's like the wind that drives away. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Spurgeon made, it very, made a powerful point that when he notes that the Hebrew proposes a double negative, not so the ungodly, not so. What he is saying is this, that ungodliness will never, never prosper. The end of their life is deemed as chaff, that is, meaningless. When you stand before God's judgment, you'll not pass. And in the congregation of heaven, the righteous, you will not be found there. And the ultimate end is misery, eternity without God. You die as you live. And the ultimate happiness is to live eternally in God's presence. And the ultimate misery is to spend eternity apart from God, which is the ultimate misery, living eternity without God. So at the end of the psalm, we, are, we, are, we recognize that we have set before us choices. You will be tomorrow what you're becoming today. You are going to become what you choose. And so David is saying, choose the right way. The way of delighting in the Lord. You know, as a Christian, you have to, constri you have to constrain your life down to what's most important. I'm going to tell you what's the most important thing in my life. You know, I'm going to say my family, I ab absolutely. But even my family, I think, will tell you, what is the most important thing in dad's life? And it has to be this book. And all that is said here. This is the way we know God. May God help us to delight in it. May we be